my research here at the university is I, I work on skeletal biomechanics of sharks, different aspects of feeding and swimming. And um, one of the, what I want to use, I want to use this as a platform to really talk about context. Because to me, establishing context is one of the most important parts of teaching. You have to create some common themes, some unifying characteristic that you can use in order to explore a variety of topics. And even if you go off in a variety of different directions, you still have that constant to come back to, which is the context. And ecology provides a terrific mechanism for that. Because if you look at the ecology of an organism as the study of that organism's interactions with its environment, it provides a platform to going into anatomy and physiology. So the form and function of an organism determines the resources that it gets from its environment. In turn, the resources that it gets from its environment are determine its ability to then contribute to the next generation. And so again, ecology is just this unifying theme that you can use to explore a wide range of topics. In this particular example uh, that we've put together, we've, got, we've, we've pulled together a variety of different um, standards that you guys are supposed to deliver to your students. And again, just the, the point here isn't necessarily the particular standards that we have chosen. It's more so of having this unifying theme that it gives you the ability to then step off to a variety of other topics. Uh, I, I'm sure, I mean, everybody is familiar with this phrase, a mile deep as opposed to a mile wide. At the same time, though, it's our responsibility to create this knowledge base. And in each higher level of the educational system, that knowledge base gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I think is that having context is a means by which to go a mile deep, but at the same time provide breadth. Because you, you have these opportunities to step off to side to side, yet still coming back to that common unifying theme. So in this particular example, we're going to talk about things like food webs and trophic systems uh, and the transfer of energy through ecosystems. We're going to talk about issues with regard to the conservation of biodiversity uh, associated with human activity. We're going to talk about examining evolution through different aspects of comparative anatomy, looking at the fossil record. Uh, and we're also going to use that as a platform through which to then explain cladistics as a means of identifying groupings within evolutionary history, classifying biodiversity. Uh, and then also, the whole context out of all of this is also a, a mechanism to establish the scientific method. How can you have students gathering information? How can you then have them both analyze and interpret and then present back that information? Uh, in a couple of the examples that you all used, the end of it was having the students then present that information back to you in one form or another, such as the Facebook page. I thought that was a great idea. Uh, and that's, that's one of the fundamental things that I, I can't underscore enough. There's a fundamental disjunction between the scientific community and the, the scientific knowledge of the general public. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that oftentimes scientists are not very good communicators. Uh, and so we want to constantly try and reinforce those communication skills. And so providing a mechanism for students to actually collect their own small data sets, analyze, interpret, and then deliver that back to you is just crucial at all points throughout their education um, to basically to train effective scientists. So we can hit on aspects of the scientific method as well. With regard to the scientific method, this is also an opportunity to branch out into other content areas. So we put together an example where you can also achieve a variety of geometry objectives. Now, I know you're under a lot of pressure to meet all of these objectives, and that it might be difficult to then branch out into, especially content areas from other classes. Uh, we, we absolutely understand that. But the, the, the point of this is just to provide an example of this common unifying theme that you can use to explore a wide variety of different topics. So we'll start out with the structure of marine ecosystems. The trophic level of an organism is basically its position in the ecosystem. And it has everything to do with basically how it gets its energy, how its energy is then communicated uh, or, or translated into the energy of other organisms. And basically what we find in marine ecosystems is that there are anywhere from three to potentially five different trophic levels in that ecosystem. And each one of them has a certain quantity of energy that's going to be transferred to the rest. If we, this is what's known as the energetic hypothesis. Uh, one of the common questions about the trophic levels of ecosystems is that why is there only three, or at maximum, why are there only five? And the reason for that is because of the limitation on the quantity of energy that's transferred from level to level. If we start at the, basically, the energy input into the ecosystem coming from the sun, you've got a certain amount of solar energy that's going to go into that marine ecosystem. 
And oddly enough, only about 2% of that energy is converted into the biomass at the base of the food chain. So this is basically the, the biomass that is developed among the photosynthetic organisms of the ocean, all of your planktonic organisms. If we then go from ecosystem level, uh, or from trophic level to trophic level, we see that while there's only a 2% efficiency at that initial transfer of energy, it goes up to about 10% as we go from level to level to level, ultimately up to what would be the fifth trophic level, which is us. So you've got basically your, your planktonic organisms, then you've got zooplankton representing your second level. The tertiary level is going to be the small fish that eat the zooplankton. Then you've got a quaternary level, uh, which are things like, say, tunas that are eating those smaller fish, and then ultimately us as the, the upper level consumers at the fifth trophic level. Um, and if you look at one of, one of the questions that emerges out of this is what are the consequences of this energy transfer? So first off, let's start with why is there only a 10% energy transfer? They're going to consume that quantity of biomass, but not all of that biomass becomes a part of the organism that consumed it. The 90% that's lost is represented by the energy burned in your metabolism and energy that's just given off as heat, that's just radiated out into the, into the universe, basically increasing the disorder or the entropy of the universe. So by virtue of that, only about 10, of all the food that you eat, only about 10% of that energy actually becomes a part of you through the growth of somatic cells. Um, so as we go from level to level to level, so on and so forth, what we ultimately find is that biomass decreases as trophic level increases because there's not enough energy at those higher levels in order to support all the organisms. When we get up to, in fact, let's step back for a second. When we get up to this fifth trophic level right here of us, if you think about any quantity of energy, that 100% that of solar energy that came into the ecosystem, one ten millionth of that energy is what ends up at the fifth trophic level. That's a tiny, tiny quantity of the energy that initially came into the ecosystem. So by virtue of that, there's limited biomass. Basically, the organisms get larger and fewer as you move up to these successive levels of the ecosystem. Now, this in of itself is a stepping off point. This is an opportunity to start thinking about consequences of human activity. Why is it that humans are growing exponentially? Our population is growing exponentially. We seem to defy this fundamental premise of ecosystems. Any ideas why? We're out-competing other organisms, but a lot of what it comes down to is the fact that we are unique in that we have the ability to bring resources to us. Every other organism in the world has to go to the resources and consume them in their, basically their, their, native, in their place of origin. We have the unique ability to bring resources to us, which is the way that we're able to basically step around this, this issue. Um, so by virtue of that, we, we've ultimately been able to support an exponentially growing population, but there's certainly evidence that humans can succumb to that pressure. Um, so again, this is just one stepping off point to go into aspects of how humans are impacting the ecosystem and how we are kind of an anomaly with regard to the way that most organisms, with regard to the ecology of most other organisms. In this regard, this allows you to then move to another tangent, which is, and again, you might not be able to get all of these, but it's just, it's this common theme of the ecology that allows you to take all of these sidesteps. In this regard, we get back to this idea of biomass decreasing at successively higher levels in the, in the, uh, in the ecosystem. Well, that is your step into conservation. Because apex predators are fewer, they are of much greater conservation concern. All the organisms that pop up as the threatened or the endangered species, they're not phytoplankton, they're not zooplankton. Those things are present in such massive quantities. It's the ones at the much, much higher trophic levels that are under much, much greater uh, pressure from human activity. From there, you can go into, in the marine example, we can start talking about differences between bony fish and cartilaginous fish. Now, we've got a mechanism to take another tangent off into reproductive biology. Start talking about different reproductive mechanisms um, and how... Oops, where is that? There's supposed to be a white shark. There it is. Um, we've now got a means by which to talk about different reproductive mechanisms in different groups of organisms. Does anybody know, what is the, how would you characterize the reproduction of a bony fish, an apex predator bony fish, such as this uh, sailfish, as opposed to that of a white shark? Does anybody know any differences between these? Ex external fertilization. Okay, so in the context of sharks, you've got the ability to describe different reproductive modes, oviparity, uh, ovoviviparity, viviparity. 
If we compare just general reproductive characteristics from bony fish to cartilaginous fishes, what we have is external fertilization in massive, massive quantities, internal fertilization in very, very limited quantities. As opposed to that of a white shark. Exactly. R versus K selected. The, this is basically gambling in an evolutionary sense. The gambling strategy that's been adopted by the bony fishes is to produce absolutely as much as possible, put very, very little resources into each of them, and hope that some of them make it. Only about 1% of larval fish actually survive to become reproductive members of that population. Sharks, on the other hand, have taken a completely opposite approach. And it turns out that the reason that they are such a conservation concern is because of this alternate approach. Sharks, shark reproduction is oddly similar to mammalian reproduction in that they take relatively long to become reproductively mature. They have very, very long gestation periods, and they produce relatively few young, but they put a tremendous amount of resources into each of those young. One of the animals that I work closely with is the sand tiger shark. Um, sand tiger shark is very, very common in aquaria around the country. What we find in those is that they become reproductively mature at about six years of age, which by fish standards is late. Um, at that, they, their gestation period is 12 months, which is a little bit longer than the human gestation period, but they take a year off between reproductive cycles. And in terms of their reproductive physiology, the nature of the, the, the quantity of offspring that they reproduce, only two at a time. They've got, uh, sharks have paired uteri, the females have a uterus running down either side of the body. Only one offspring is produced and basically viable out of each of those uteri. So what we've got is a group of organisms that takes until they're six years old in order to reproduce. And once they start reproducing, they produce only two offspring every other year. So by virtue of that, they're at an inherent disability with regard to replenishing populations. So when humans put fishing pressure on organisms that have low reproductive output, that's why these particular organisms are a greater conservation concern. So again, common theme of marine ecology, stepping off points into all different aspects of reproductive physiology, reproductive modes, human influence on, uh, on marine ecosystems. From here, this is also a means by which to then start talking about cladistics, how we define different groups in evolutionary history. You can use cladograms that have these shared derived characteristics, basically defining characteristics of each of these major groups of vertebrates as a means to describe why certain organisms are grouped together and why they have certain sets of adaptations. So let's keep, for example, this comparison between cartilaginous and bony fishes. Well, if we go to the common ancestor of all of these, so we've got cartilaginous fishes right here, chondrichthys, then we've got the bony fishes and all of their descendants as osteichthys. The common ancestor of all of those organisms had both jaws and a, mineral, and a mineralized skeleton. Basically, it had a bony skeleton. So what does that tell you about sharks? What was their, sharks, what's the defining characteristic of all sharks? Cartilaginous skeleton. Right, now you have an opportunity to start explaining why one group has a certain set of characteristics as opposed to another. It turns out that this common ancestor right here had jaws and a mineralized skeleton, but it didn't have a swim bladder. Things sank like a stone. So negative buoyancy was a major issue with regard to all of the evolution of all fishes. They would sink like a stone because they had this big, clunky, heavy skeleton. Well, if we look at the radiation of all of this biodiversity, we see that there's one of two strategies that were adopted. If we go into the sharks, they adopted a lighter skeletal material. Cartilage is less dense than bone, less negatively buoyant. That said, they still are negatively buoyant. They still do sink. Uh, the alternative to this was to keep the bony skeleton and evolve a buoyancy mechanism, which is then the swim bladder. So here we've got this common theme of, say, sharks. We're exploring comparisons in biodiversity, and by virtue of that, we can identify the nature of cladistics, which is identifying these shared derived characteristics. All right. Now we can start going into aspects of branching out into other scientific disciplines, for example, geometry. If we look at the ecology of all sharks, what we find is that the diversity in their ecology is largely associated with their diversity of teeth. The shape of the tooth determines the cutting performance. The cutting performance of the tooth determines what they can eat, and what they can eat is the basis of their ecology. So you have this means by which to use, to use biology as the context for explaining geometric differences. If we take a look at some of the, just the diversity of shark teeth here, we've got bull shark teeth, uh, just tip of stereotypical triangular form. Here, these are the teeth of a black tip shark, much kind of narrower, more appropriate for piercing. But 
you've got a variety of different teeth of very, very different shapes. And again, so you can explore the consequences of geometry. Geometric differences translate into functional differences, and functional differences translate into ecological differences. So again, we come back to this common unifying theme of ecology. Um, and especially any kid growing up in Florida knows something about sharks. They've heard of bull sharks. They've heard of black tip sharks. They know somebody who goes fishing on a regular basis. Um, so this is, a, this is a particularly relevant example for students that are in Florida. Okay, it turns out that this is also a stepping off point to talk about aspects of animal behavior. There are basically two phases, two immediately kind of proximate phases to the feeding performance of a shark. Sinking the teeth into the food, and then this second phase, which is called lateral head shaking, which is whipping the head back and forth to then tear the teeth through the food. What makes one tooth effective at one of those might make it less effective at another of those. Oh. So let's look at, this is a, a juvenile lemon shark, and you can see once this, kind of, yeah, all right, there we go. That's, this lateral head shaking behavior, it runs smoothly. There. So basically, phase one, teeth sinking into the food. Phase two, whipping the head back and forth in order to saw the teeth through the food. So what we're basically talking about are geometric properties of the teeth that facilitate their penetration into that food, and then different set of properties that are going to facilitate the, basically the lateral movement of the teeth through the food. And you can get at this with basic geometric principles. With regard to the first part of it, the, which of those teeth, uh, which type of shark tooth is going to be better for puncturing a prey item, this is a matter of pressure. Pressure, regardless of the, the example that you're using, all pressure is calculated as force divided by area. The relevant force here is going to be the bite force of the animal, and the relevant area is going to be the lateral surface area of the tooth. So if we assume that bite force is constant among, these two different, among all of these different animals, it's basically the geometric properties of the tooth that are going to determine the pressure and subsequently the performance and the ecology of the organisms. It turns out that there are convenient ways to represent this. And again, I know that you might not have the time or the opportunity to branch this far out into it, but if you talk to, let's say, developing common lesson plans with members of the, of the math department in your schools, potentially you can build these common threads these, these, to make all of the content more coherent as students move from classroom to classroom. It turns out that you can easily model a shark tooth as a right square pyramid, and from that we've got two examples here. You've got a black tip shark tooth, again this kind of narrower, uh, more kind of a piercing-like cusp, and then a bull shark tooth which is more triangular. If you give the students the basic geometric properties of these right square triangles, they can do things like calculate the area of the faces of this triangle. And once they've, got, once they've made those, uh, answered those problems, they can ultimately then determine which of those teeth is going to be more effective at penetrating into a given prey item. So again, the, the, the idea here, and this is just a particular set of examples, the idea here is establishing context. If you talk to any author, any writer, establishing context is fundamental to engaging your audience in the story. As educators, that's part of our job. We are storytellers, in a sense. You have to create engaging material to try and invite students into the issue. Context is that, basically, that, that doorway to bringing them into it. And particularly with regard to biology, ecology provides very, very good context because ecology is the consequence of anatomy and physiology and it's something that came about in it, through, over the course of evolutionary time. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a, this opportunity to have this common theme from which you can branch off into a wide variety of areas. So um, I mean, that, that's one of the things that we feel is very, very important in the educational process. And um, again, the, the main point here is whatever the particular context is, if you have that unifying, thing, it, unifying theme, it's something that the students know as a constant and you can always relate back to. In all of the examples that you've talked about today, there is a concept that you can use at the core of that. With regard to meiosis, the concept is the life cycle. We're diploid. The only way to have diploid offspring is to have this process that brings you to the haploid state so that maternal and paternal haploid information can bring you back to the diploid state. With regard to the interrelated nature of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, the concept is the building and burning of fuel. And if you think about it as each of these modules building upon the knowledge base that you've established before, you can look at things like the plant and animal cellular structures. Who's got mitochondria? Everybody's got mitochondria. So that means everybody burns energy. Who's got chloroplasts? Only the plants. So that, fun that sets up a fundamental ecological distinction. Once you set up those distinctions, you understand 
who's, where, where photosynthesis is relevant, where my, uh, cellular respiration is relevant. And again, it all comes back to this basic idea of building and burning fuels. Some organisms do both. Some organisms do just the burning process. Um, so that's all I've got to say. But uh, hopefully you found that useful.